Once again, good morning, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as I said before, my name is Ana Sophia. I'm the Communications Manager at Skyland Alliance. Um, let's get started with today's presentation. I really wanna thank you for, for taking time out of your Thursday morning to come learn about Jaguar research with us. Uh, before we get started talking to our guest presenter, I would like to just go through a few housekeeping items. I am sure most of you are used to these by now. Um, I want to start by thanking all of Sky Island Alliance's volunteers, partners, supporters, and donors who make it possible for us to do the work to protect wildlife throughout the Sky Island region of the US and Mexico. You are the backbone of our work and the ones who keep us going and we could not do any of this without you. I also want to acknowledge the privileges that we have to be here on this land today. The Sky Island Alliance office is located in Tucson, Arizona on the land of the Tohono O'odham. Pascoyaki and other indigenous peoples. Our work throughout the Sky Island region is on both sides of the US-Mexico border and takes place on indigenous land. We invite you to join us and our website for some resources about local land acknowledgements and about present day tribes that live here in the Sky Island region. So we'll post a link to that in the chat. Other things to note, please stay muted during this presentation, but feel free to type any comments or questions that you have in the chat, either here in Zoom or over on Facebook Live. We will save time at the end for questions and we will be monitoring that during the event in case something comes up. Um, and if you need to leave the presentation early today, a recording of our presentation will be up on our website this afternoon um, and an email will be linked out to everybody who registered for this event. We will post a link to our coffee breaks page in the chat so you can check that out. With that said, it is my great honor to introduce today's presenter, Ganesh Marin. Ganesh is a researcher at the University of Arizona, and we are very excited to hear from him about his Jaguar sighting earlier this year, as well as the difficulties he and other researchers face in their ongoing studies, including the need to preserve the main corridors that connect wildlife populations between the US and Mexico. This presentation ties in nicely to Sky Island Alliance's Thousand Cats project that we launched earlier this year, where we hope to document 1,000 instances of wild cats, including jaguar and ocelot, throughout the Sky Islands to help better understand and protect their current habitats. This is work supported by the National Park Service Southwest Border Resources Protection Program. So thank you to them for helping us get this work going. We will post a link to the Thousand Cats Project in the chat if you're interested. And that is my spiel, and I'm now very excited to pass this over to you, Ganesh. Um, if you would like to introduce yourself to everybody, um, that would be amazing. Yeah, thank you, Anna. And thank you, Emily, for the invitation. I'm really pleased to be here with, with all of you and with your audience. I am excited because I'm pretty sure that it is a really motivated audience. So yeah, let's make things fun and interesting for this talk. Uh, yeah, my name is Ganesh Marin. I am a biologist. I am Mexican. Right now I am doing my PhD at the University of Arizona yeah, and I am also a National Geographic Explorer. So what I am going to present today is part of my work for, uh, for my PhD. Uh, but I made it mostly because as most of you, I am in love of this place, which is called the Borderlands. So I wanna show you part of my work and part of the most interesting things that I have seen here. And of course that, that will lead us to the the sighting of a jaguar. So that's why I call these studies of water mountains and a jaguar in the borderlands. Uh, most of you are from Tucson, so you will see some familiar landscapes, but um, let's see how this, how this works and how important is the water and the mountains in this region, especially for diversity. So let's start talking about humans, humans in this planet. And I love to present this part because if, if, if we could put all the, life in a scale, we could see that plants will be most of, a, of that weight. And there, that tiny percentage is from animals that we can see in the, first, in, the, in the first square. And from there, we can see that arthropods like, are like a, most of the weight. Then if we can go back, we, can, we, we go down, we can see mammals like us, like uh, other animals that have hair and nurse their babies with milk. And we can see that humans represent like 36% of that weight. Or livestock represent the 60%, and the rest of thousands of species of wildlife represent only the 4%. 
what this means that we have changed our planet. So we are full of basically cows, chickens, and humans. And the rest of that, only a 4% is for the rest of the wildlife. And of course, that is reflected in the world. When we see uh, how the, the ecosystems are managed now, you can see it, just a few spaces like the Amazon, the Congo Basin, uh, some parts of Siberia, uh, like as natural places. Most of the, of the rest of that is used and managed by humans. And over there, uh, we live and we interact with several species. And, it, and that's part of the work that I'm doing. Right here in uh, the borderlands, that it's between Mexico and United States. And more precisely, you know that this part of the borderlands, of the Western borderlands, it's a very diverse place. It's not just desert, it's not empty, it's full of life. And the place I am talking about right now is going to be right here, just between Arizona and New Mexico, in the United States, and Sonora and, Sonora and Chihuahua in, in Mexico. And if we look in an image from a satellite, we will see this, this rugged landscape. And if we start to put attention to this photo, we will start to see lines, lines in the landscape of different colors. The first one that you can see there, it's a green meandrous one, really vibrant. And this one, this line, it's El Cajon Bonito. This is a creek that crosses from, that borns in the continental divide in Mexico and, and runs through the west. And uh, well, it, I, I, I don't have to say you that it's beautiful, this place, but it's full of life. And it, it is because it has water. And uh, probably, you know, pretty much if you live here in, in Houston on this part of Arizona, uh, but water is everything. It's like the veins of the West. And with life and with water, life comes. And it comes in different, in different ways. Uh, for example, this is one of the southernmost places where we can find beavers. Yes, American beavers. And let me know that, let me, let me tell you that most of the Mexicans don't even know that we have beavers in, in Mexico, but we have it, we have them here in the, in the in this part of the country. We have in this Cajon Bonito stream, we have several species of, of endemic fishes, which, which, have, which are endangered. Um, but also these kind of ecosystems uh, change a lot during the year and between years. Here is a photo uh, between two different seasons, just two months of difference. The first one is in the dry season. I took, the, I took uh, that one in, in May, and the other one I just took it uh, like a week ago. And you can see how, how easily it changed that uh, river. It just stopped flowing superficially, and that affects wildlife. And, and wildlife, it's, uh, it's, it has to learn and has to adapt to live in this uh, rough environments. I took this picture in, in May, where most of the fishes uh, die if they don't, if they are not able to move upstream, or, really, or if they don't find a, a good pool to, to, in, to endure the, the hot temperatures. But yeah, wildlife is adapted, and, and, and the lesson for them is that you have to follow the water, just like uh, these dogs in the, in the stream. And, just, and the animals do that, just, just as us, we follow the water to thrive and to survive. Uh, but there are other, other lines in the landscape. Uh, the second line that I want to talk to you about is the Federal Highway number two. This highway is in Mexico, and this highway was constructed in the 80s. And, uh, and because human impacts doesn't mean only infrastructure, it means other things like, uh, like movements, like trash, like, like poaching, like noise. And we as ecologists, I am biologists, we're trying to understand the effects of not only of the infrastructures of yours, the, just the, the highway per se, but all the human impacts over the wildlife that it's living over there. We are still starting to understand that kind of, of interaction between, between us and other wildlife. And the third one that it's pretty, it was not really obvious in the past, but it's now becoming more and more obvious in this part of the country. Is the, is, the, is the border between Mexico and United States. And as you know, uh, even this place is beautiful. We have now uh, 
different kind of construction of where the wall. This is the Normandy phase. This is called the Animas Valley, which in the past used to be only barbed wire. And uh, heard some bisons were able to cross. This is the Animas Valley. Uh, I have some cameras. I'm doing my research over there too. Uh, yeah, bisons used to cross to, to move back and forward between one country and the other, also pronghorns. Um, but now they are not allowed. For other wildlife, they are still able to cross that. But things move faster. And when I started my, my research like two years ago, this was a, the picture I took just at the very beginning. Now, um, like six months ago, this is the same place. Now we have uh, the border wall, which um, is causing something over, over the wildlife. And we as researchers, we want to know that. There is a lot of research that is saying that is, this kind of infrastructure is affecting how wildlife move. But we want to know in which extent this is affecting that. Like at which species, which corridors, and which kind of movements. Because like us, wildlife move in different ways. Sometimes from finding mates, some others for finding food, some others for finding water. And, uh, and of course, that has different impacts on, on who you are as a species and who you are. If you are like a, a male searching for, for your love of your life, or if you are like a female looking for praise for having your babies in the next season. And yeah, uh, we humans, we constructed a different kinds of barriers and fences. And we, that's something pretty obvious in the past that has something some effect of the wildlife, but we as ecologists, we are just starting this thing called fence ecology. And that is like a, trying to figure out like a, how different fences affect wildlife. And of course, we have some kind of fences like the border wall, which is more obvious, but we're starting to see that other fences that are more ubiquitous, like a barbed wire fences, and which are everywhere, are affecting wildlife in several ways. And, and in this place, it's, it's where I saw this, this thing I was talking at the very beginning, that we are humans are mostly everywhere. And this photo is showing a, a scat of a black bear, but you can see also some trash. And when I am doing and setting camera traps over there, it's common to see th these kind of things, the same paths that the animals use like bears, which are which have similar movement like us, um, are the same paths that are using humans. And that's something that we have to work with, not only with biologists, but also with, with um, politicians, with the uh, people concerned about security. Yeah, this is not only a deal for a while, this, uh, this is something that involves all of us as a society and involves all of us, like uh, considering nature, in that context. So yeah, as a biologist, you always want to work only with your animals and that's what really moves me. Like, uh, for example, my research is focusing see the interactions between carnivores, like uh, how the top predators like a puma and the black bear in this landscape is interacting with the small ones and how the coyotes and bobcats are in the middle, like uh, interacting with both of them, but we, we acknowledge that there are like a, also a physical landscape, like a different seasons, different kind of ecosystems. And that is going to affect all this kind of interaction between these species and where they move and where they are. But then you start to see that we humans are, have such an impact that we, that we have to also consider land management. Because in the land, if you have like a, if you are a cattle rancher, but uh, or if you are like a farmer, you will have different impacts of, on the wildlife and how the wildlife is, is interacting between them. So for doing that, what I am doing, and I am pretty sure that you are more, more familiar with this now, uh, these ones, this technology used to be really expensive in the, in the, in the past, now it's more affordable. And, and I know that the Sky Islands have also a, a really big effort to doing, uh, doing this, is by installing camera traps. Is the, is the one that it's put in the, in the tree over there, which are cameras that are triggered by motion and heat. So they took pictures and videos with some wildlife is crossing there. Um, so I, I have set 
a hundred of, of these camera traps along, along this landscape just to answer these kind of questions. Like, uh, where are the humans? Where are the black bears? Where are the, the pumas? What are, what are the most diverse corridors? And what are the most used uh, landscape, uh, uh, parts of the landscape, uh, just to determine which, which are the main corridors that we have to conserve in the future, and just to direct future actions. Um, yeah, and here, here I am, I, I am like setting the camera trap. I love this video because I just put it like a three months before I got the Jaguar over there. I was pretty excited. I, I, at that point, I, was, I never know, I never imagined that. But we are really always excited. This is my, my, my girlfriend and also biologist and National Geographic Explorer, Daniela Cafayi. We're really excited when we set this kind of camera traps um, because we know that cool things could, could happen when you like are like spying the, the wildlife. Uh, and yeah, we got a, bu a bunch of videos, like a gigas and gigas and thousands and thousands of photos of some familiar species for some of you. Like uh, if you live in Tucson, you are able to see like this, um, this, this uh, fox or coyotes, like that does pretty common things like, uh, or does. This coyote is marking. And then for example, it's important to see where are these species because coyotes are usually associated now to humans. And, if, and what we are seeing right now is that when you have cattle ranching, uh, the, the abundance of coyotes increase. So we're by all these work trying to see those interactions between humans and certain species like coyotes. Or if you are more like a cat person, you will be more interested in like a in the how it's like this bobcat that is just like a using this road to roll over or this kitten who is calling his mom and uh and i don't know about you i'm pretty uh, i heard that people in Tucson uh, saw wildlife pretty frequently uh but i am from michoacan from a state from mexico where, where all the vocals come from um and we're not too used to see that kind of wildlife, probably you. But then appears some wildlife that is more hard to see, like uh, like pumas. And you can see like different patterns, like this 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 female with their with their pups, with their kittens, and others like this giant beaver in this landscape. Like a, you know that you have the creek over there. And you have uh, these beavers, which is awesome that are still there. But and you are thinking like, uh, okay, so these beavers are interacting with pumas. Yeah, you're starting as well, always like making these kind of questions and being, being really involved for the fauna right here and start to making different questions. And it's like, a, for example, right now after all these storms, I am thinking like, a, where do beavers go when the floods come? Because they come really hard, so they hide in some places. I'm really thinking about that. And I, and I am right now just thinking like, like uh, put some colors to this beaver to see where they move, where uh, a flood is coming. And, the, and we have like uh, these other ones, like this big uh, black bear, which is my favorites. And yeah, as we are really curious for them, yeah. Other species like flowers are really curious from our devices that we left over there in nature. They love to destroy camera traps, so we have to put it in some metal cases just to avoid to be destroyed for, from, from bears. And we have some incidents like this. Here used to be a camera trap just right in the border, but uh, yeah, it was stolen. So yeah, that's kind of the of part of the job, but we still have a lot of data and we are still motivated. I'm trying to see how this, like, this wildlife is using these different kinds of environments, like this grassland. Uh, and some other things happen, like this one is the last video of that camera. After that, that camera starts to, to monitor fishes and then he, yeah, he stopped working. And yeah, at the, when I found it, it was like this, just that yeah, I lost that camera. But then you are rewarded like with this kind of, of reward of, of, of videos. And I was really thrilled to see that video 
which is of the Jaguar. And it, and it was like, a, I love this video because he was looking right to the camera and he was wet. That, that Jaguar, with, with child, we called El Bonito. And it's called El Bonito because it was in the Cajon Bonito Creek. Um, yeah, it was the first video of this Jaguar resort in the place where I was setting the camera trap. If you remember, that was also in the Cajon Bonito. And I was just scrolling um, the videos. I, I, I do that in the, in the side to see if the camera is working well. And I just remember to, to saw that I saw something big and spotted. I was with one friend with Kevin Dragon from uh, who was doing the, his master's in the Arizona State University. And it was like a, saying like, a Kevin, come on, come on, here's something great. And it was, I, I didn't start to jump. And to shout, I was just like a, it was like a deep emotion, like a feeling, like a hearing, hearing the river, hearing the what, hearing the wind in, in the in the trees, and just that deep deep feeling and that happiness of being in some place where a jaguar it is, and that you are in the very northern range of that species, and you are sharing that landscape with that feels awesome. Some people told me like, uh, you were scared. No, I was like, I was saying like, whoa, this is awesome that I'm using the same paths uh, that this Jaguar. And I was able, able to capture Jaguars in um, in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. We were, it's uh, one of the, uh, there is a big population of Jaguar over there. Uh, and it was a great experience too. But knowing that there is just a few individuals in this part of, of of, of the country and we catch we are, we catch them on, on video that was awesome and and let me tell you why uh well this is the uh, in red in that map you can see the the historic distribution of jaguars we forgot that as um, as americans and, and as, as mexicans we forgot that we used to have jaguars as, as far as the great canyon and when you tell people i'm pretty sure that you in Tucson you know about the jaguars there is big murals everywhere, and I love, and I just love that everyone is so thrilled about jaguars. But most of the people in the United States doesn't know that you have jaguars here. They associate jaguars with, with the with the Amazon, Amazon basin or with with tropical environments, and even for Mexicans, we don't know that jaguars come uh, that that far. Um, but yeah, and the last female we have in the United States was in 1960. Seven, no, 1963 or seven. Well, the, the year where, when Kennedy was killed. Every American remember that, that year, that Kennedy was killed in that year. But we just forgot that we have female Jaguars in the United States. And it's not, not too far ago. It's just like uh, less than a hun hundred years. Uh, but because of poaching and because land, um, land use change, Jaguars uh, had to go to the south, to the mountains, to the natural refuges for most of the species, especially if you are like a pretty big and you are a carnivore. So right now, the biggest, um, the, only, the population, and which with that I am meaning that have the males and females that are uh, having uh, babies are in Sonora. And that it is not really far, it's just uh, like uh, 80 miles from the border. So that's another thing good that we have this young jaguar, El Bonito is young. Uh, you can search for videos of, of big jaguars, of males. Look for example videos from uh, El Jefe or Macho B and you will see that they are like a bulky, they are more muscular. This one is looks like a more slender and because how it is moved, you can tell that it is it's a young individual. And what we, what we know about young individuals is that they're not so far from their mom. And that's good news. And that's good news because the mom is not so far. So that's what, what, I, what we think as psychologists is, is that Jaguars are coming back to this part. And they are coming back because a lot of efforts, both in the United States and in, and in Mexico, to bring back Jaguars. There is a lot of campaigns about uh, conscientized people, cattle ranchers, top poaching, uh, putting uh, the jaguar on their, their red species list in both countries are endangered in Mexico and are endangered species in the United States. 
And I think that's working. It's a lot, it's a slow process, but it's working and we have to keep on that. Um, and in this map, which uh, was from a paper in 2009, they, they thought that there were two main corridors. And they, you can see there, one is really close to, to the border between Ari, uh, Arizona and New Mexico, which is exactly the place where I am working with. And the most important thing with jaguars is that jaguars are considered an umbrella species. And that means that if you conserve jaguars, just because jaguars are big and need a lot of space and need a lot of food, and they're kind of shy, automatically, we are protecting a lot of species. We are protecting both cats, we are protecting um, blackbirds. So having jaguars in your environment means that the environment is healthy. And that's great because if how jaguars are able to move between both countries, that means that a lot of families of blackbirds, beaver, bobcats, and insects and birds are able to move to, and also water. Uh, look, look there at the map in the, in the right, it's the ocelot. We also have ocelots over here. I can send you the video because it's now under, in a publication that I am hoping to, to be out really soon. Um, but we have ocelots here too. And they're pretty similar. They are felids and they are using this landscape because we have that a water and, and, and an ecosystem and, and a healthy ecosystem. And let me tell you something that probably you know, especially if you are here in the Sky Islands region, it's how mountains uh, give diversity to the landscape. And this is a, a, um, a diagram made by one of my favorite explorers of all time. Alexander von Humboldt, who was the first one who made these kind of maps. I mean, it's pretty obvious to us right now, but in the past, they, they just start to think that as you go up or down the mountains, you will have different set and a range of species, not only of plants, but also for other mammals. So why we have jaguars and why, we, why, why these corridors are just right here? And this, and this is because we have mountains. And this means that you have a different set of environments that go from the grasslands, the desert grasslands, to scrublands, to oak forest, and then to pine forest. And that means that you have like a blackbird able to move down for the water in the summer, but go, they could go up for food in the pine forest or to eat, eat the acorns in the, where are the oaks? And the same for jaguars. And that's why this, this this region is so diverse and a, a really important corridor. And yeah, exactly. I, uh, with that video that I took like a, three days ago, I want to show you that, that we have mountains. And you know, I mean, if you live in Houston, you will know that you can spend one hour and you will be in pine, in pine forest over there um, in Mount Lemon. And it's pretty dramatic. You are in a different country over there. We have that. And that's pretty exciting because we're learning too much about that. And this is another video of El Bonito. And, and I will say that this one is also one of my favorites because most of the research of jaguars, they saw, they say that jaguars use a lot of uh, forested um, landscapes, but we are learning like uh, they could use a different set of landscapes. Like this one, you can see like UCAS, and the, and the prickly pear. So I honestly, I wasn't expecting to see Jaguar in this part of the landscape, but with this and more and more records we, we can grow, we can have a better picture of which, and the, which ones are the ecosystems that the Jaguars are using to move between Mexico and the United States. So then we can make like a better, better approaches to restore that connectivity. And yeah, just as I tell you, jaguars are umbrella species. For example, in this other uh, research, but other, other guys, they use uh, blackberries, pumas, and, um, and wolves to predict which will be the main corridors within both countries. And they just found that just the place uh, where I am working with, and which is land of uh, Cuenca Los Ojos. And, uh, and yeah, you, you just have to Google Cuenca Los Ojos. Uh, they have an, an awesome, an awesome web, website because they have made an awesome work starting with the water. 
So Valeria Clark, like a few decades ago, they started to, to, to protect this land with one single purpose, and that's protect the water. And with water, as I told you, come everything. So right now we're protecting Jaguars just because of, of the work of this fantastic woman to start to protecting water. And that's really important because we humans, we depend principally on water, but also the ecosystem services that all these species are, are bringing to us. And it doesn't matter if we live in the valley, these, these ecosystem services come from the mountain from miles and miles away. So we have to generate that kind of connection between of life or lifestyle in the cities and with what, on what is happening in the mountains because we are really, really connected. So right now, another part of my research is not just to look not only for, for terrestrial mammals, just like jaguars and blackbirds, but also different kinds of species because this kind of human um, infrastructures could affect different species depending on how they move and their size. So we're also re uh, doing research with bats. And here I am uh, during June, we, we put mist nets in the Cajon Bonito and we catch bats. And they give us a, a lot of information because, because bats fly. So they use the landscape in a different way. So we're trying to see, okay, if you're a terrestrial mammal, it's pretty obvious that this fence is gonna affect your movements. But what happens if you fly? It's gonna be the same. We predict that not, but we're just, we're still looking for those for those answers. And we we had nice surprises. Like this pallid bat, I love this bat because this one um, used to uh, eat scorpions in the night. Uh, but we found 13 species only with misnet. We are also all, we are using other devices. Uh, like recorders to, to capture those bats. And in the next year, we are going to put some GPS colors on blackbirds to see day by day, hour by hour, how these species move across this landscape. And blackbirds are more abundant, abundant than jaguars. I mean, I would love to do that with jaguars, but there is probably one or two in this landscape. So it's more easily to catch blackbirds. Um, and they move a lot. And they will deliver us a lot of information about how these big species use this landscape. And if they are still able to move it in both countries. Um, well, so I will be glad to talk to you about more of the results when we have more. And let me tell you something that this is not only, this is not only me working with her, this is a big effort. And uh, a big effort that includes a lot of people, John Koprowski from the University of Wyoming, and Michael Brown from the University of Arizona, who are my advisors, um, the amazing work and support from Cuenca Los Ojos that uh, are conserving this work and help me uh, with all the logistics, Anila Cafagi, who another Nazi explorer and all, and all the National Geographic Society that are helping me to, to, get, to get this, uh, to share how the beauty of this place. Uh, Rodrigo Sierra from Santa Lucia Conservancy. Yeah, a lot of people who is involved in this research because the science is, is something collective. So you have some, some more questions or you want to get in touch, there is my email and we have called this the BERT project, the Borderlands Ecology and Landscape. Um, uh, there is the Instagram. So you can you can search search the project over there. And yeah, so I don't know if it's still, it's still time for questions, but uh, thank you. And thank you for letting me share this passion I have for this landscape. Um, so please share it uh, with me if you can. You just text me. Thank you. Thank you, Ganesh. This has been amazing. I have to say your wildlife videos have been so inspiring to see all the bobcat kittens and the black bear. And I loved the, the, the video of you and your girlfriend dancing after setting up your, your camera. That's just such great enthusiasm for this region. So we do have a few questions. Um, well, yeah, we'll take about 10 to 15 minutes to do questions. Um, so the first one is, what sort of actions can people take in this habitat to protect cats like jaguar and ocelot and mountain lion, bobcat? Well, the first thing is to be, I mean, that depends on what you do. If you live in the city, 
one of the main things is to vote and to vote to people that are considering this in their agenda. I mean, the main threat for this species is the loss of, of the land, of the of their homes, their ecosystem. So we have to try to find a way to maintain that, that forest up and, and those uh, creeks flowing. That's the main thing. Another thing is poaching. We have to be uh, keeping an eye of people who are poaching illegally because that's another threat, especially for example, here in Mexico with the jaguars. And uh, I'm trying to conscientize uh, uh, the people who are uh, trying to see this wildlife. I mean, I'm pretty, much, pretty sure that all these audience love all these species, but not all the people love jaguars, especially when they tell the story that they eat a lot of cattle. And sometimes that will happen, but there are some some ways and some ways to manage cattle to reduce that. Um, and I think it's working to still have jaguars out there. So trying to have these kind of conversations is really helpful. And to try to make the connections between ecologists, biologists, cattle ranchers, people in the city, uh, politicians, try to, to keep that conversation up is, is needed. So yeah, I will say that. Thank you. Uh, I have a question from Nicholas. Are the ocelots in the borderlands usually dispersing young males like the jaguar? Um, so are male ocelot as common? In yeah, as far as we know, it's only males. And they're far more elusive because they're small and they're more cryptic. I mean, yeah, in my experience there, it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, yeah, it's just like dogs. It depends on, that's why videos are really useful. <laughs> just depending on the angle, you can see if there is a boy. Uh, but because also lots are small, it's hard to say that um, um, with full certainty. Uh, but the populations of ocelots is not really far. I think it's in it's in Aribabi Ranch, which is like a uh, fifty miles to the south from Nogales. So it's not it's not far. So female ocelots are not far too. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Facebook. Are you collecting data on non-mammals also in your research? Uh, right now, my, all my research is focused on mammals. I mean, I consider some, some uh, variables of the landscape, but yeah, it's mammals. And the other thing that I, I didn't include here because I, I'm just going to start that in a few weeks, we're doing some in, called environmental DNA. So this is basically you go to, to the to the creek and take a sample of water, and from that you collect all the DNA from every single species that that was there. That sounds is magic even for me. It's just like a CSI but for wildlife. So that's fantastic because even with a hundred camera traps, it's hard to catch these species. But so we're going to test how good is this technique from DNA to find cryptic species like jaguars and ocelots. And probably this, this is gonna be more easily, for example, for agencies or uh, that doesn't have too much time to put a hundred camera traps because it could be exhausting to walk all these mines. I mean, it's beautiful, but yeah, it's a lot of work. All right. That sounds super fascinating. Um, so next question, what steps need to be taken to ensure corridors remain open for wildlife between the US and Mexico? Well, right now we have still some corridors. For example, the Guadalupe Canyon have some doors open, uh, just emit the border wall. We're going to see if the, if the wildlife is still using those corridors. That's pretty important because, and yeah, it's hard to say that because our knowledge as a scientist about how animals do, move day from day, it's pretty limited. That's why it's gonna be really exciting the GPS colors of black bears just to see if they are like a using, like a trying to cross the United States or from, or from the United States to Mexico and pacing the border wall and, and how they try, or, or, if they know, or if they know exactly which corridors are still open. We want to know that. And with that information, we will like a make specific proposal, like a, hey, you politicians and yeah, everyone. The, the jowers and the bears are using this corridor. We have to do something here, just in this part. And there are many, many options to do that. 
like uh, put some bridges or for example, we're, that, we're still, that, that's an open question. Probably the highway here in Mexico is doing a pretty much uh, the effect of a barrier. We want to see that probably, and that barrier has been since the eighties. We want to know that the effect of that highway. So we can put some overpasses. So while it's called wild, wild, uh, bridges for wildlife or just like expand the culverts to be, um, to make possible to wildlife to cross under the highway. That kind of a strategy is we can use. And of course, like a doesn't expand the border, what would be great. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, how many species have you seen on your cameras? Do you know? I'm still counting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have far about, yeah, I don't, I haven't count like a 15 mammal species. Um, your favorite that you've seen? Yeah, I mean, we have bobcats, ocelots, jaguars, pumas, uh, the beavers, squirrels, ground squirrels and the fox squirrels, uh, five, uh, four different species of skunks. Yeah, uh, the canids, the foxes, the, the coyotes, and, and the other ones that are not like a specific for that kind of wildlife, like beers, like the dogs I showed you, some bats even in camera traps, yeah. Yeah, but I am still checking that. I am so behind that I have to do. Thank you for reminding me that I have to do that. I, I have gigas and gigas to analyze still. I bet it's always very exciting to check cameras and see if there are any new yeah. mammals that show up. And those, yeah, those videos are just so great. Um, I don't, oh, we have a couple more questions just came in. Are there any native fish surveys going on in the areas that you're doing your work? Yeah, there's a lot of people, uh, the concern about fishes here is not part of my research. Um, there is some other fish biologists, we're like a talking, and they're more focused in, for example, here in San Bernardino Valley, where I am like a, doing this presentation. Um, there is a, the Jackie catfish, which is really endangered, and they're doing some research with that. But we, we still have to, to do a lot of research, like a, to know like a, how the species move between each season across the Cajon Bonito, that would be uh, great to know. Um, and for example, with that, the eDNA samples would be great because we, um, for fish it's more, it's more easy because they live in the water. Nice. Um, so something that we've seen on our cameras at Sky Island Alliance has been porcupine, which has been very surprising and interesting. Have you seen porcupine as well on your cameras in Sonora? No, I haven't. Oh. I, haven't I, saw, I saw the one you have. I was really excited because the other day I have for the first time a badger in one of our camera straps. But no, we haven't had that with the porcupines. So yeah, I mean, and that's why we we need this kind of collaboration. So yeah, we, since the very beginning of the pandemic, uh, we had a conversation with Emily just like a discussion, oh, what you are doing? Like, uh, yeah, we're selling these camera traps in this region. And because this region is so diverse that we have, I am pretty sure that we will have different set, set and a range of species depending where you are. If you are more in the valley or if you are more in the mountains or in the canyons, you will have different uh, species over there. And so the same fence will affect those populations in different ways, just because you have different species. That's it's why we have to replicate this in many other sites. And, we'll, we'll, and it's gonna be great to share all this information between, between you guys from Sky Islands in the future. Yeah, and it just will be interesting to see if the porcupines can actually cross down into Mexico with the border wall the way it is right now, so. Yeah, and the most essential question, like uh, how many are out there? Yeah. Uh, we have a question, another question from Facebook for you, Ganesh. Have you had any issues conducting research with Border Patrol on the US side or any other enforcement agencies? I am working right now in the Mexican side. Sometimes, yeah, they are curious. <laughs> they send me the helicopters just to see what I'm doing because it's just like I am in random places in a truck, just like in the middle of nowhere with a truck or walking. But yeah, uh, um, I, I, I didn't ha have any any bad experience with, with any of those guys. They just like uh, see me, this guy is doing something strange. So I use camera traps, but I am the Mexican side. And I speak with everyone. I mean, like a camera ranchers in both sides, 
of the in Mexico and the United States, they, they kind of know what I am doing. Some agencies, of course, so that I have work, permit, permits to work here with Cuenca Los Ojos. So yeah, like I spread the word to know who is this guy, like a moving randomly in the in the mountains. Okay. I have a question from Kent asking if jaguars will go extinct. No, I mean, in Mexico, there is some estimates and it's like a 4,800 jaguars in the wildlife over there in Mexico, just in Mexico. And there is another big population, really big one in the Amazon basin, which is the biggest one in the uh, in Pantanal. Um, and that's why if you look in the IUCN, you will see that jaguars is not endangered because there are many of them. I mean, some other species are really struggling. Like uh, there is only a uh, 100 of the individuals or probably less. But jaguars, there is, I mean, we can count jaguars in thousands. But something important to say is that, I mean, it's really important for Americans to have jaguars. And it's really important for Mexicans to have jaguars. It's really important to have, for the people in Arizona to have jaguars, because the jaguars in that place are the ones that are ensuring that the landscape, the forest, and all the ecosystem services in your region is coming to you. So it doesn't matter if the jaguar is in danger, is in the area of extinction or not. We have to protect every single, single population because we as humans that are living out there, we depend on that population of jaguars. So yeah, we have to do every last effort to maintain the jaguar populations here in the borderlands. So Fernando asks how does your information help to take decisions in Mexico for stakeholders and governments? Uh, you have very important information on your cameras and in your research. And so how is that used? Yeah, one thing that we scientists are learning about is that, uh, I mean, we, we have to publish our research, but it's just one single step. We have to translate that information to the public. And that is not going to be written in our like a fancy language, science language. We have to translate that in actions. That's why we have a really close interactions with cattle ranchers. And we start this project also asking them, what do you want to know about your landscape? I mean, I have this kind of information, but and I have my questions as a scientist and as ecologist, but they they have different questions because they have different concerns. So we have to start to talk with them. In, for example, I am starting with this project, but in another one, they were really concerned about the predation of pumas and, and coyotes. And they used to cult uh, pumas. And what I showed with, with the camera traps is that as far as, as, as they were killing pumas, the coyotes were increasing. And coyotes are far more, uh, they, they eat a lot more calves. So they prefer to have pumas instead of of coyotes, so it's better to have to doesn't kill to don't kill the, the pumas in order to have control the coyotes population. That kind of and that's because the cattle ranchers are concerned about cattle. And yeah, we have to to translate that information and to go and there and knock the door to the politician in your region and say, hey, I have this information. We want this. We want uh, this bridge for the uh, in the in the highway and to find other like uh, NGOs just like you who have different kind of audiences and contacts. And yeah, that's part of the scientists right now. And this is part because we are like a, in, an, in an emergency because we are losing so many species and so many populations that we have to take action. Not, not just wait for the politicians to read their work, just to go them and show them and make really clear petitions. Awesome, thank you. So I think we are out of questions. Um, and so I just have one more for you, Ganesh. Um, how can we support the work that you do? And is there anything else that you want us to know about your work before we uh, finish up for, for the hour? Yeah, it's just spread the word and find the, the local organizations that are in your town, independently of where are you working or where are you living? That's why your work as Skylines Alliance is really important because it will direct uh, to, the, to my information to other audiences and get involved with that. I mean, most of my time I'm out there lost in the mountains. So I, 
pretty much interacting only with bats and bears. But yeah, speak with others, talk, be curious. We, now we have Google and other sources of information. Try to find the best information and the best reliable sources. And yeah, just be motivated and love your landscape. Go there, go out in mountains, fell in love with the diversity. And with that passion for your land, yeah, I think that's a better weapon we have to protect that, to feel connected with our land. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Ganesh. It's been amazing to hear from you and see these videos and, and really just think about the ways that, that we can come together to continue to protect these habitats and these wildlife that make our region so special. So, and thank you to everybody else who joined us today. I hope this presentation was fun and informative for you. Um, we have a couple um, coffee breaks coming up the next couple of weeks. We have one uh, introducing our photofauna project and the other one um, on the 21st is doing a recap of a year of photofauna, which is basically photos that people have taken of wildlife in their own backyard as part of a community science uh, monitoring project that we've been running the last year. So we would love to have you on either of those. We've dropped a link in the chat to both. Um, so those are just some upcoming coffee breaks. But otherwise, have a great rest of your week. And thank you again so much for joining us. And thank you again, Ganesh, for taking your time today to speak to us. We really, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Have a great day.